Do I need to click? Oh, okay, good. All right, we're live. We are let live. Me, let me check right. this here, and we're going to see if everyone can hear us on the YouTube channel. Okay, cool. All right, let us begin. So today we're going to be talking about privacy and about Beam and essentially uh, asking Benny, the CMO of Beam, uh, his thoughts and philosophies on privacy, uh, the state that it's in today and where it's going in the future and how Beam uh, intends to present themselves in this privacy technology world and what we are going to do with that. So Benny is the CMO at Beam, and we have a few questions or a number of questions submitted by the community earlier that we're going to ask to begin with. And then we're going to move on and answer any questions that you have uh, from the live chat. And yes, this is, I'm Angus, sorry. And I will be asking Benny the questions. So Benny, the first thing that we're going to ask you is to tell us a little bit about your background and what interests you in privacy and what brought you to Beam. Thank you, Angus, for that, for this uh, this uh, incredible introduction. And, and hello to everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here, although it's already night uh, here in Israel. Um, and so you, you forgive me for the light. Uh, so I'm Benny, like uh, Gus said, uh, I'm a BIM CMO, uh, but I'm also a humble philosopher uh, dealing with philosophy of sciences for the last 20 years. Um, I was born and raised in France, uh, but living in Israel for the last 25 years. Um, dealing with crypto for the last, at least a little decade, my first Bitcoin was, you know, around 2010. Um, and since then, I'm, I'm you know, a, inside the crypto community as a watcher as somebody that is trying to to think uh, a, in a most general way the ethics and the morality you know well a very technology oriented world and i came to be in because uh, obviously i found something that uh, did bridge and still is doing uh, this bridge between uh, a very simple i would say ontology a, meaning a kind of philosophy of a living and an amazing technology based on limbo limbo. Absolutely. Uh, so, I mean, essentially, a lot of what Beam is doing is centered around privacy and the focus on, on bringing privacy to uh, essentially everyone and financial privacy. So in the news and, and in the media lately, there's been a lot of focus on, on privacy, essentially, by large corporations and this kind of thing. And I just, one of the questions was, uh, where do you see privacy now in 2009? Uh, sorry, 2019. Yeah, I mean, I, I wish we would, you know, in 2009, this would yeah. be some very cheap. Uh, and it's a very good question. I mean, you, you, I mean, somebody from the community is asking about the symptoms uh, of this uh, big sickness, which is called the lack of privacy and financial privacy in our world today. Uh, so yeah, we've been, you know, uh, seeing uh, and also uh, victims of a lot of a uh, privacy breach um, and scandals uh, within the big, uh, I would say, five uh, uh, corporations, uh, meaning Google, Facebook, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, those are only, I would say, you know, the same part of a very big iceberg, uh, which is called the lack of privacy. When both corporates and states are trying, you know, to avoid us, to, to deal with our own privacy and to reach it. Um, they're not doing it in purpose. I mean, we are not here at Beam and me especially. We are not big fans of uh, the theory of uh, conspiration, stuff like that. This is, this is not us. Uh, we just uh, are uh, very pragmatic when it comes to privacy. Obviously, a lot of states are going cashless. Uh, meaning that they are not uh, allowing their citizens to use the most private uh, mean of payment, which is cash, in order, you know, to to move us uh, in a general way to the, uh, I would say, electronic way and the controlled way of paying. And I mean, it's not a, a big news, but most of the big uh, corporation today, uh, beginning by Facebook, have a, 
uh, the business model based on uh, the lack of privacy and the fact that they are dealing and even you know trading our digital identities on our on a daily basis the situation is i would say a, a kind of a, a objective a vision on our a golden gel where we are living which is called the internet uh, the internet was created you know something like 50 years ago uh, by the military and but when once it moved to the civilian society it was supposed you know to open uh, the gates to knowledge to everyone in a very free mode and i would say 25 years after the the, the digital revolution uh, we are uh, living in a kind of jail where in order to reach some uh, services we need to renounce on our privacy and it's even more I would say, a, a relevant when it comes to the mobile. And with this, a, I would say, a very strong, you know, tool, which is called, you know, a, this mobile phone that is, you know, following us and spying on us a, without any kind of knowledge. And the idea here a, is not to try to understand that privacy is only a kind of a human being, you know, a, a human right, sorry, um, a, that needs to be defended and, and, and uh, granted by the states. I mean, uh, the privacy states in 2019 is in a very dangerous mode. And we need to wake up a little bit and we invite you at BIM, but not only at BIM, uh, to uh, educate yourself and to try to understand a little bit better how and why you need to protect your privacy on a daily basis. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this relates quite a lot to, to one of the things that I hear often is that if the product or service is free, and especially online, if it's free, then you're essentially the product that's being sold. And I mean, it's it's difficult to avoid this sometimes. And for many people, it's it's seemingly unimportant. So I mean, it's a, I think it's a much of our responsibility to try and a, to spread awareness essentially and, and to teach people about why privacy is important and, and move from there. Definitely, but maybe if I may, you know, uh, answer to, to what you, you just said, we need to define maybe at first what is privacy. Uh, if you are going, you know, for, for uh, defining privacy in Japan, for example, uh, you will have some difficulties because the translation of the word in English privacy doesn't exist. There is no such a thing like privacy in Japanese language, I mean. And the online a, 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 a revolution is forcing those states like Japan to invent or to recreate a concept based on privacy. But I guess that it, it would be very interesting to define what is privacy. So privacy, it's not a new concept, I guess. It's something that was born in the 19th century as a concept, as a right to privacy. The first time that it was published it was at the end of the 19th century was done by Rowan and Glenn Reeves. Um, and it, the concept itself uh, evolved uh, with the time. But for those people, it was two bodies. You know, privacy meant the right to be left alone. Um, and it's quite simple, but it's a little bit uh, uh, inadequate for our modern you know, understanding of the concept. Uh, we had to wait 100 years in order to see another definition to the concept of privacy. It was done by a very nice scholar, uh, called Alan Vestin, I try to update the concept of privacy. And he, I guess he defined, if I'm not wrong, the privacy as the desire uh, of people to choose in a free way uh, uh, under what circumstances uh, uh, and to what extent they will expose themselves, their attitudes and their behavior to others. So as you may understand, it's a little bit more, I would say, complicated concept. Uh, a little bit later, Tom Jerry uh, understood uh, privacy as the control over, uh, over the autonomy of the intimacies of personal identity. Uh, and Tom Jaredi did connect the concept of privacy to, I would say, individual sovereignty or identity. But at BIM, and me especially, uh, in a very humble way, we, we, we chose to, um, to define privacy the way Mate Daniel Zabo did a couple of years ago. And Zabo argued that privacy is the right of the individual to decide about himself or herself. So if I need to resume what I just said, privacy at BIM and for me, and I hope that for everybody else, means freedom, freedom to choose what to disclose, when to disclose, and why to disclose any kind of information about yourself. And now, if you look back about our former discussion regarding Facebook, Google, and all 
those big tools that are free. Uh, they are not allowing us to decide about ourselves, but they force us to renounce on our privacy in order to enjoy any kind of free services. Absolutely. And uh, I think this is this is visible in what uh, Beam's planning to do in terms of the auditability of the wallet and this kind of thing. I mean, you uh, you have the right to disclose the information that you want in regards to your finances. It's not it's not a opt-in privacy, which I think is flawed. It's opt-in audibility, which I think is is giving individuals and companies and this kind of thing the the freedom to choose what they disclose, which I think is essentially uh, what you said about Zabo and and his definition of privacy is. Uh, it's largely related to uh, to allowing others the information that you want them to see. And I mean, a lot of these, and yeah, privacy differs between cultures and, and countries and this kind of thing. But I think, uh, I mean, if you take away the right for people to disclose information, then that's that's a real problem. It's a real problem. And if we look at history, uh, and especially in the 20th century. I mean, every kind of totalitarian uh, regime, like the communist one or the Nazi one, uh, did a uh, touch at first, once they reached the power, uh, the privacy right to the people. I mean, and, and we have been seeing also a very nice example. It's a fiction, uh, although, but it's a very nice example in, in these incredible you know, comics that turned into a, a good movie, V for Vendetta. That was a, a, in a very specific way explaining how people are losing privacy on a daily basis and where we are going if we are renouncing our privacy. But what you said is very interesting also because, I mean, we are living in a crypto world today. We are speaking on behalf of the name of BIM, as you may know. And as a community manager, I guess, a, uh, of the BIM community, you know it better than me. Most of the people today are wrong about the crypto. Um, it's a very big paradox in terms of privacy because most of the people do think that crypto is private, that everything that you do on the crypto is private, that nobody will know ever what you've done with your Bitcoin, your Ethereum, or your Litecoin. But this is untrue. This is 100% untrue. I mean, you just have to go to Etherscan for any kind of Ethereum you know, transactions. And if I have your hash, I will be able to see all your transactions, whether you want it or not. So, I mean, what we are trying to do at Beam it's also to educate the crypto communities when it comes to privacy and to let them understand that it's not because you are anonymous or you are using Bitcoin in an anonymous way that you are in a very, very specific situation where your financial privacy is kept and safe. It's exactly the contrary. And I would say something that will not please a lot of people here, but it's better for you. I mean, if you are looking for privacy and financial privacy, I will suggest you, recommend you to use cash and not Bitcoin. I will recommend you to use your credit card, your Visa and your MasterCard, this legacy system, and not any kind of altcoins because they are not private. They may be anonymous, but they are not private. And we need maybe to, to discuss the, the definition of anonymity uh, uh, versus the definition of privacy, because this is something that is related to the same, I would say, ontological concept uh, which is called privacy, but uh, anonymity is not private and privacy is not anonymity. Yeah, absolutely agree. I mean, uh, it's uh, interesting that you mentioned cash. I think that the world and, and hum humanity has used cash for such a long time. And I mean, it's essentially private. Yeah. And here we are in the digital age and, and that privacy is being kind of taken away. And cryptocurrencies essentially take it away more. I mean, they're opening it up to everyone. Like you said, uh, you can look at Etherscan or you can look at the Bitcoin blockchain explorer and everyone can see it. Sorry. And yeah, I've, I mean, sorry, and I've, sorry. that's okay. And I've spoken to people about this and, and they've said, and, and this is one of my, my closest friends that I, I have worked with in crypto before. And I've, I've tried to explain privacy to him and he just doesn't, he, I mean, maybe for him, it doesn't matter, but he said, if he wants his transaction to be private, he'll send it to an exchange and then withdraw it from an exchange. 
which I which I couldn't. I mean, for me, that was the, the craziest idea ever. But this is this is one thing, and and many examples like this that I think require us, as, it, not us as in Beam, but us as in the crypto community and and people that are privacy ad, advocates to try and and educate. I mean, educate what is privacy and and how you can deal with privacy, not how you should. That's my opinion, anyway. Yeah, and I mean, that's, very, that's very true what you said. That if we take it, you know, this discussion to the next level, which is you know the business level. I mean, think about that. Only one second. As a business, do you really want you know your competitors to know with who you are working or who is your supplier and how much you pay you? This is not something that you are willing to disclose in a public way. So uh, if we, we need to, to resume in a very, I would say, childish way, today the crypto is not built for businesses. It means that the adoption is going to be very complicated because, again, without any kind of financial privacy, which is not, like we said, only a human a, a basic right, it's also something that is needed in order a, a, to a, a, for an economy to be working in a proper way. Without any kind of financial privacy, it's going to be very difficult to conquer and to, to force to adoption uh, the world, I would say, you know, business, legacy business world. So it's a question that Beam is trying to resolve. And I guess that we did a beautiful job with that because we are aiming, of course, to offer, you know, a privacy and financial privacy to everyone. But we target also businesses because we understood perfectly that without any kind of financial privacy, no business will be able, you know, to adopt cryptos in a very, I would say, you know, a friendly way. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. And actually, this someone's asked in the YouTube chat, and I think this is important to, to define the differences between, uh, they've asked, what's the difference between anonymous and private? Oh, ah, it, 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 I mean, you can, you know, really uh, say thank you to the one that asked uh, this question, because I... Obviously, this is this is really my baby, uh, as you may know. I've been, uh, we've been working you and me, you know, guys, for a long time now. So you know that uh, all what is related to concepts and to philosophy is very interesting. I mean, if we need to define what is privacy, I mean, like we said, uh, privacy uh, is something that we are going toward. I mean, it's a past, but it's also a goal. It's a whole concept of a, a ontological a, a approaches, a, a and. Something that is private is something that is kept for yourself. I mean, I'm going to give you an example, a, a very specific example a, a, based on what we are doing at Beam. When you are sending some funds, you know, when you are using, you know, Beam, uh, not only as a crypto, but as a wallet, nobody is able to see because the transaction is not, you know, written on a public, uh, public blockchain. It's a private blockchain. So nobody is able, you know, to watch what you are doing unless you are providing him with the right to do it. Anonymous uh, or anonymity, it's something a little bit different. It's more related, I would say, to the name and to the state. Uh, when privacy is a right uh, and confidentiality is a tool, if we need also to add the concept, I would say, of confidentiality. So if we need to resume, anonymity is the name, is a state. I mean, I'm being you know, anonymous, meaning you don't know my name. Privacy is a right. It's kind of value. It's kind of, I would say, ethical value. And confidentiality is something, is a kind of tool that can you know, help you to reach privacy. So anonymity is a kind of state of affairs, I mean, on, on a metal in which an individual or any kind of corporation uh, is not known by or spoken of a name. If we need to take, you know, a very good example, uh, I don't know who are the people that are asking the questions now. Uh, it means that we have a kind of anonymity, uh, but we don't have any kind of privacy because obviously what they're asking is public. So if we need to resume here, it's uh, something that we could say that a person, anonymity and being anonymous, is a person that can be non-identifiable, unreachable, or untrackable. Uh, we could say that anonymity is a kind of technique to reach uh, other values uh, like privacy and liberty. So let, let me rephrase it because it's a little bit you know, complicated maybe uh, in a live stream on YouTube to explain this kind of uh, philosophical concepts. But let's say that anonymity is a tool uh, to reach a, a value and ethics, what we will call, you know, privacy and then like liberty and freedom.
Is that clear? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, is someone asked in the chat after this as a follow-up question, is, I mean, for the greater public and, and for mass adoption essentially in, in crypto, do you think that the differences in confidentiality, uh, sorry, in privacy and anonym, anonymity, do you think that these these differences are are important to the to the end user, the the John Smith and the the general public? Do you think that the do you think these differences are important, or are they going to be lost on on the general public? I mean, we call it in philosophy a, a rhetorical question. I mean, you're asking the question because you know already the answer, and the answer is obviously. Yes, I mean, the gap between anonymity and privacy will go and will grow bigger and bigger day after day. And I mean, you just have to look on any kind of a, 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 a website dealing with cryptos and you will see more and more uh, new cryptos going on the privacy path. And you will see also more and more uh, uh, already existing cryptos leaving the anonymity and embracing the privacy, I would say, identity. And I'm speaking here, obviously, about Ethereum that uh, most of their founders uh, said last week that they are going for privacy. And I'm also speaking about our friends from Litecoin, uh, Charlie Lee, that said that he is you know, uh, trying to implement with our help Mimble Wimble on a Litecoin uh, because he understood that one of the X factors or one of the, of the keys to mass adoption is privacy. No one, and I'm saying that, no one will use any kind of crypto on a daily basis if he doesn't know that his financial privacy is kept. Or I would say in another way, if he is the sovereign on his financial privacy, that he is the only one that can decide when, why, and to whom to disclose any kind of financial data. And today, a, I mean, I wish you good luck if you are dealing with uh, uh, some cryptos and you want your CPA or your accountant to audit those transactions. It's going to be very difficult for you because not only of the lack of the trustability of the funds, but because mainly of the fact that it's totally public and this is something that does not work with the legacy system. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that this is this is something that's obvious in the, the crypto that we have to this day. I mean, one, one important thing that uh, a question came up on in the chat is about the opt-in auditability. And it's asking uh, what happens if, if the government or someone comes and, and forces you to opt in. And one of the, I think, I mean, essentially it would be broken if it was backwards compatible. The opt-in auditability, auditability is uh, only from moving forwards. So if I if I opt in today, it doesn't show yesterday's transactions. And I think if it did show yesterday's transaction, it would essentially be uh, broken. One of the one of the things that came up in the submitted questions from the community was regarding to how uh, Bean is going to integrate more broadly into not just the crypto privacy discussion, but also into the, the general privacy and, and the practical use of privacy technologies in the modern world? I mean, this is super important. When we decided to create Beam a, 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 little, bit, um, a little bit more than one year ago, I and mean, we began you know, the world story of Beam in March, uh, March 2018, uh, we had a very interesting call and very, very interesting in the discussion and debate within the core team. And we asked ourselves, who are, who, who are our customers? Why we are doing that? I mean, to who we are going you know, to provide this technology? Uh, nobody, and I can tell you that nobody said that we are going you know, to work for the crypto community and for uh, the Bitcoin maximalists or these kind of things. Nobody spoke like that. We decided to do BIM. Uh, to, I mean, it's an incredible thing to uh, uh, consider Alice, Bob, and Carol as our customers. And to remind you, Alice, Bob, and Carol don't understand nothing about technology, don't understand nothing about, you know, cryptography and stuff like that. Those people are my parents, your parents, are your grandparents or something like that. Um, they barely know how to use their credit card and we want them to use crypto. 
uh, it's very complicated. So in order to assure any kind of a, a mass adoption, which is a, a very complicated concept, mass adoption in crypto, it's very complicated right now. It's very experimental in order to be in you know, mass. But we decided, you know, to uh, to to reach those people, to educate them in a very humble way by uh, trying to let them understand that until now they are renouncing on some very important privacy layers in their in their lives and it could harm them in a very serious way in the future and if not them their, their children um but in another way uh, the privacy and the crypto is i mean the best formula it's the best equation to to convince those people that a uh, crypto it's not an insult it's not this big world a uh, big world that is, you know, a, a related to any kind of scam or any kind of, you know, of mafia stuff, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Crypto is only a part of a monetary and biodiversity that is very needed today, uh, because our worlds, and I'm I'm speaking about worlds in plural, because we are not living in a unique world. I mean, if you are living in China or in the U.S., you are not living in the same world. If you are living in the north or in the south, you are not living in the same world. If you are living in Venezuela or you are living, living you know, in uh, in UK, it's not the same world. So our worlds today are going centralized more and more every day. If you want to wire uh, tomorrow uh, abroad some USD or some uh, euro, then uh, the Federal Bank in the US and the Deutsche Bank uh, in Germany will have you know to say something about that because they control definitely you know the euro and the USD. The biodiversity in the Monterian world is something that can be a kind of warrant to a freedom and to a financial, you know, sovereignty for each one of us. And BIM is trying, you know, to, in a very gentle way, to convince all those people that are not in the crypto community that they may be interested by something that is done inside the community for them. If I need to resume it, BIM. And in general, everything that is done around Nimble Wimble, we are not, you know, the only ones, is done by the people, for the people. We are not trying to keep this technology and this, I would say, treasure to ourselves. We are willing to share it with everybody in a very, very, very popularized way. Yeah, I think this is this is the key essentially to to allowing privacy for people is to make it easy. Oh, easy enough to use. I mean, if it's if it's creating a, a hurdle for everyday users to enter, then this is this is something that will just stop, and this will lead to them giving up, uh, giving up privacy essentially in order, f or sorry, for convenience. I mean, and and I see myself also doing this. If something is more complicated and private. And something is less complicated and not so private, then sometimes I just go with the less private way. And I mean, I, and this is this is the trade-off. I mean, it's more easy because it's less private, and so I'm paying for the convenience or paying for the ease with a uh, with my privacy essentially. And this is one thing that I think is important with Beam is that there's no trade-off. The no. E the ease of use essentially is is also. Uh, like a quality that will go with the privacy and i think this is this is something that can really drive drive privacy not just for for beam or cryptocurrency but also for the wider privacy uh, space this is this is exactly this and you know it, it's amazing that uh, i was supposed i mean i was about to speak about you know our user-friendly experience uh, but privacy means uh, to be also user friendly. I mean, at Beam, we are we are aware of the fact that crypto is not that user friendly, and mass adoption with I would say a CLI wallet it's going to be very complicated. I mean, come on. Uh, so we've created also Beam uh, around the concept of uh, of being user friendly. That's why we have you know uh, um, two amazing wallets, both on iOS and Android, and we have also you know amazing desktop wallet for for Mac, for Windows, and Linux. Because we are perfectly aware that if we don't come to the public, if we don't offer to a, a, to a wider audience exactly what they are using today in terms of usability, then it's not going to happen. I mean, you can create new habits today. Our lives are so busy that you are not able to create any kind of new hobbies and new habits. So that's why we, we try at Beam to combine your boss privacy and user-friendly experience. And this is creating a good, I, I, I would say, a good recipe to success.
which is to reach a, a wider audiences. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, this this leads well into one of the questions submitted by the community. Uh, I mean, friendly user interface and friendly UI, uh, UX. Uh, these are important to to help beam adoption and and this kind of thing. Uh, what I what the question is is what other things are you are, is Beam doing to make it easy for users to essentially use Beam uh, as a store of value and also as a means of exchange? Oh, this is a very interesting question because you know being also SOV and MOE, it's going to be very complicated in the same way. So I just want you know to invite our nice community to be very patient with that. I mean, the best way to avoid doing things with success is doing two things in the same time. So like we say, you know, in Arabic and in Hebrew, shwaya shwaya, very, very gentle, piano piano in Italian. <laughs> I mean, let's speak about the user-friendly experience. And like I said, we have five today wallets, different wallets for five different, you know, operating system, which is already a, a, a big achievement for us. But the, the main problem today for crypto, and I mean that most of the people that are fully listening to us and seeing our very tired face, and for me, my old face uh, are, uh, I mean, the best, you know, use case when it comes to the lack of user friendly UI, UX and experience in the crypto. I mean, how much is difficult to reach and to buy, to acquire your first something in the crypto? You need to use fiat, you need to wire, you need to do KYC, AML, and then you can get something. And then it becomes a little bit more easier. So the best thing would be uh, for Beam to ease this process. And that's why we are working today uh, on a very big, I would say, effort to implement uh, some uh, incredible technologies that will allow and ease the process of acquiring Beam. Uh, whether it's using fiat or other cryptos, uh, it's not a surprise. It's not also a big news, but we are uh, going to release in the next couple of weeks from now our swaps with Bitcoin and Litecoins uh, uh, that will, you know, is the process of swapping between, you know, those two uh, incredible coins and with Beam. But more than everything else, uh, I guess that mass adoption will come also once, you know, Beam will be listed on uh, the tier one, you know, changes and it's going to happen uh, very soon from today. I can speak about that because obviously we don't want to impact the price in any way. This is not something that we are doing at Beam and we will never do something like that. Uh, but I can let you know that we are very, we are working very strong to be listed uh, on the main places where people are today trading and buying, you know, some cryptos. But we are working also to to, to build some bridges with the outside world, meaning the fiat world, when uh, the main model will be uh, to uh, ease the process of acquiring the first beam, and then it's going to be much more easier uh, to do that. So if I need to resume, also that I mean, obviously, swaps exchanges and bridges with the external world yeah absolutely i mean this this covers another question that was asked uh, about exchanges and this kind of thing and i mean of course this is something that we know is important and and that's something that drives and increases adoption and awareness and we're working on it and uh, i think one of the most for me anyway one of the most interesting things is the atomic swap uh yeah. And like uh, like you said, with the uh, the graphic user interface wallet, I mean, this will take more time, but this will also increase people's ability essentially to to participate. And I Definitely. think that this is, and I mean, this is something. This is a problem with crypto as a whole. And I mean, it's a maybe a bigger problem with privacy coins up to now. I, I remember buying the, even if you want to explain to someone how to buy Bitcoin, it's difficult. Uh, you go on local Bitcoins or you go here or you buy from, from someone on BISC. I mean, it's, it's more difficult to get into crypto than to send transactions or anything. And I mean, so, so I think the, the, if the, there is a way to, to have fiat onboarding for Beam, then this would be a great thing. And not just for getting into crypto, but getting into crypto uh, with a head start and in privacy, essentially. Definitely. And there is another part to, to what we are trying to explain here. So if we spoke about, you know, how to fill your wallet with beams, what you will do with beams now. So let's speak about, you know, the mean of payment or the mean of exchange. I mean, if 
Beam obviously is meant to be at first an SOV, a store of value, of course. But today we are working also very strongly in order to onboard any kind of a shops, e-commerce websites, or any kind of businesses that are willing to accept beams in order to offer our community the capacity to buy stuff, services, objects, goodies, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, with beams. And this is already happening. I mean, I'm very glad that our core team today in Tel Aviv, uh, uh, we bought you know some uh, amazing art piece uh, with beams. Uh, and you are more than invited to visit our uh, Medium blog, you will have a full list of all the shops that are today accepting beams, and, and this list is going you know, bigger and bigger day after day. So we are perfectly aware you know, at Beam because we are not new I mean, in this market, and obviously, with all due respect, we are not that young also. So we've been a couple of things, we've, been, we, we've seen a couple of things before we went to Beam. So we are perfectly aware that a, a, a business in order to be working and a solution in order to be working must be, you know, of course, private, must be, of course, user friendly, but in another way, it must be usable. I mean, think about that. Today, the crypto, it's like entering a Chinese restaurant, for example, a, and eating, you know, ordering some food and the food is coming and you don't know how to use you know, any kind of chopsticks and you don't, there is no fork, you know, there is no knife, but you don't know how to use them. So you are not going to eat. I mean, obviously, because we are polite people and we are not eating with the hands. So you are not able to eat. So this metaphor is really real also for the crypto. I mean, you can you know buy, you can hodl, you can do a lot of things, but spending it, it's another story. And since we are going for privacy by default and businesses are looking for financial privacy, so BIM in a very uh, simple way will be much more usable when it comes you know, to buying stuff or acquiring uh, any kind of goodies uh, with our you know, private uh, privacy-centric uh, uh, cryptocurrency. Yeah, absolutely. Funny you should mention uh, this. Actually, just uh, yesterday or the day before, someone shared uh, a guide essentially for buying a VPS or a VPN with yeah. being a, a Chinese community member. And I mean, this is this is something that anyone that's spent any time in China will know that the internet is is a different internet. To, ac to access the rest of the internet, you you need a VPN and a uh, before I moved to London, where I'm, I'm located now, I was living in China for five years. And one of the most interesting things is uh, in China, you can use Alipay or WeChat to buy a VPN if you're a Chinese citizen. If you're a foreigner, you can't. And so I, I'm, I mean, I think maybe now it's more difficult than it was then. But this was something that, and I mean, I shared it with the with the expat communities that I know in China, and I mean, it's this is a, a real use case. I mean, this is some regulation that's been imposed on people that essentially uh, hinders the information that they have available to them. And I think that that if there's a good if there's a good use case for privacy coins, then then this kind of uh, free access to information is is one of them. Definitely, I mean we, we are very happy because the first shops or the first uh, services that accepted Beam as a means of payment were VPN and VPNs in Asia. It means something for us from I would say a pure political point of view because we are helping people here uh, with technology to acquire freedom. And I don't know if you remember, maybe you are too young for these kind of things. But the, the main purpose of the cypherpunk movement uh, that I discovered in the middle of the 90s when I was a, a student um, was to abandon a, a violent revolution, I mean weapons, and to bring to the people technology to help them to get free. And I mean, if I need, you know, every day, and this is something that I recommend to everybody here, but when you are going to sleep, and you ask yourself, I hope that you are doing that. You ask yourself, how was my day? Did I, uh, uh, did I, I mean, did I deserve my, I would say, intellectual salary today? So dealing with being and helping those people to reach freedom is very, very, very satisfying for us today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, this this was something that I've, I felt quite special as well. I mean, I'm, I'm not, not so old enough to to remember this cypherpunk movement but i mean uh, it's something that i think many of the community feel strongly about 
uh, even if they weren't around when it began or this kind of thing. And I think it's important. I mean, I, I remember when I was, uh, I won't say when, but when I was young, there was, I mean, DVDs became a thing. And the, the encryption code to essentially unlock and copy the DVDs, this number became illegal. So the many governments around the world made a number illegal. And I mean, it's, uh, I don't want to get into politics, but it's uh, stuff yes. like this that, that really is important for, for everyone, essentially. I think Definitely. that all of this information available, we should be able to, to uh, attain it. And I mean, it shouldn't be, it, it shouldn't be put in our faces just because we gave up some privacy that told the company that's giving it to us some information about what we search or what we look at or where we yep. shop. Yeah, this is this is exactly this. And and this follows in nicely to one of the questions from the community is a. Uh, I, I mean, we've mentioned Asia and in terms of this VPNs and this kind of thing. What other locations or, or sort of regions do you think uh, are important for Beam and, and for, what, for which reasons? Oh, and this is a complex, yeah, this is a complex question you're asking here because if we are speaking about marketing, yes, we are speaking about marketing, then it's a different thing than, you know, speaking about, you know, business operations, stuff like that. And I, I, I'm going to speak about what I know and what I'm doing with, with my team uh, at Beam. Um, today, uh, we're not trying, you know, to 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 touch uh, and to, I would say, to reach the whole world. We're trying, you know, to to concentrate on several, you know, regions and areas. Uh, when we we do build a kind of priority list based on several, I would say, items and uh, and rules. First of all, uh, our marketing, and this is very important to say that our marketing is 100% organic. We are not buying any kind of fake users. We are not get, buying any kind of content and stuff like that. This is not us. I mean, you will never see something that is called paid, you know, a PR on Forbes or TechCrunch about Beam. We are not an ICO and we are not doing these kind of things. So once you, you agree that this is a very, I would say, natural growth that you are looking, you need to tell a story. And actually, most of the, the work that is done by the marketing team at Beam that I have the honor to, to, to humbly uh, manage um, is based on the storytelling that we are trying you know, to implement in several areas, but also based on a, a kind of game rules or game field rules that we are trying to build with every local community. So of course we are going for Asia, but not for the same reason that everybody in the crypto world is going for Asia. We are going for Asia because of what you said, Gus, before, because in several countries in Asia, I mean, free access to knowledge a, a, is a, in danger. We are going for Asia also because we have, we have been lucky uh, because most of the uh, crypto users are based there. And uh, this region is very interesting because of its diversity in terms of languages, in terms of culture, and in, in terms also of philosophy concept. I mean, for me as a philosopher and a marketer, it's, it's so you know, it's so good to be working with uh, the Chinese community and the Japanese one, for example, but also with, with the Viet one and the South Korean one because of uh, the way, the philosophical way of, of their cultures. They understand, I mean, you people in Asia, you do understand stuff that in the West, they still didn't get to understand because of a lot of things. But if I need to resume that, so Asia is our main target country, uh, area when it comes to marketing or to storytelling. We don't forget uh, Europe, but Europe is a little bit more complicated because of regulation and because also of a kind of tech latency, especially in the Latin countries in, in Europe when it comes you know, to crypto. Uh, and of course, we are talking to the US and to North America. But if you ask me who and where are our main customers and when target and why we are waking up every morning to serve those people and dealing with, uh, with our technology, I would say that Africa and South America are our, or mine, I would say, top markets because obviously crypto there and in general, uh, I would say monetarian 
uh, biodiversity is really needed on a daily basis. I mean, you need to open the news to see what's going on in Venezuela, unfortunately. You need to open the news and see what's going on in Africa because uh, of inflation and because of uh, some stupid, you know, monetary policies. And I would say something that maybe is going to surprise a lot of people here, but you must see and understand our friends and brothers in Iran today that are under US sanctions, economical sanctions, and the people, I'm not speaking about the regime, I'm speaking about the people, but the people, our brothers and sisters are suffering that much because of a, a, those policies and those sanctions that they need. And I, we've been, you know, we know that they are working on their own crypto, but they need to find a way uh, to, to reach any kind of, would say, of financial sovereignty by, you know, maybe embracing the crypto movement. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is, and I mean, I, I agree. I think this is really important to, to focus on essentially not, I mean, not places because they will buy lots of the coin and the price will go up, but because, uh, I mean, it's, it's needed. Yeah. The current, the current stuff that's going on there is, is not adequate and, and it needs improving. And whether it's through beam or through Bitcoin or, or anything, then, I mean, that's a step forward, in my opinion. Exactly. And this is, I mean, this is something that is quite uh, important in our team. Uh, and maybe we, I need to, to, to admit that maybe we are not that strong in expressing those, I would say, ethics, uh, uh, ethical, sorry, uh, 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 things. But this is something that is, you know, very deep inside uh, the core identity of Team B, uh, trying not to save the world because, I mean, Obviously, we're not Superman or we're not the Flash, the fastest man in the world, although you know, our lighting concept is based on that, but then it's another story. Uh, but we are trying to enhance and to fix where we can fix, because dealing with technology means that you have a huge responsibility. And this huge responsibility means that you need to think in a very much ethical way. If not, I mean, technology for technology means nothing for us. Yeah, exactly. I'd just like to clarify that I'm extremely, extremely fast. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this leads into a question that was asked by in the in the uh, YouTube group. Someone asked, yeah. uh, "Is Beam directly working with uh, any government entities that develop, or sorry, in order to develop like a regional auditability uh, for Beam?" No, not yet. I mean, and if we will do it, we will do it really not in 2019. And I, I'm quite certain it's not going also to happen during the first semester of 2020. Before we go and before we, we speak to uh, local authorities, we need to design our auditability, our compliance POC. Uh, and this is exactly what we are doing right now uh, uh, with the help of one of the big four. It's an audit firm, I can't name them, but we are trying you know, to design uh, our POC when it comes you know, to, to, to compliance. And once we will understand exactly what needs to be done on a pure, I would say, technical point of view, then we will be able to reach each and single you know, regulator and to, with a lot of humility to offer our, our propo proposal when it comes to, uh, a, to turn our crypto into a fully you know, regulated and fully compliant. Yeah, It's way too early. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I've seen a lot of news coming out in crypto that's, I mean, the project doesn't have a proof of concept, but they're partnering with this company to do this and that and this. And I mean, essentially, uh, there's not much substance behind it. I think that it's important. I mean, and I'm sure that work will be done with uh, regulators and this kind of thing in, in terms of figuring out how to build the auditability in the in the wallet but on the technical side this stuff will take some time to to come to fruition yeah i mean definitely if we would have come you know to the regulator right now with our current technical situation technology situation it would be a disaster i mean we have we don't have any uh, uh, enough i would say you know meat to analyze and we are not ready when it comes to our POC, our compliance POC. So the regulator will be able to eat it, to eat us uh, uh, with no salt, <laughs> with no problem. We want to come to the regulator in a very strong way, in a strong position with a strong community, with a lot uh, of users and happy users, hopefully, uh, and also with a clear vision when it comes to our compliance uh, strategy. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it makes complete sense. And I, I and actually, especially when dealing with regulations and this kind of stuff, it's very bureaucratic and slow. And I mean, it, it takes a lot of time, not just on the development side, but on the on the figuring stuff out and and the communication side and and this kind of thing. I mean, it's a uh, it's one of the interesting parts about being that that will grow over time and i think it will it'll really be shining in the in the future definitely cool benny i think yeah. we're gonna sign off there i mean it's uh Already? yeah <laughs> it's almost been an hour oh. <laughs> i've asked if there's any more questions from the community let us okay. check out someone's asking about exchanges Okay, uh, we, we are listed on more than 20 exchanges today. Uh, big names are coming uh, eventually. It will happen before you can only you know, wait for it. Uh, and it's going to be legendary, don't worry. Cool. Yeah, I mean, uh, from my end, I'd, I'd really like to thank Benny. Uh, the insight into not just the marketing of Beam and this kind of stuff, but the insight that he shared tonight and also in, in general in terms of privacy and the philosophy behind it for me is something that that's important and i think uh f for me it's important that it resonates within the community so i hope going forward we can karen saying where is angus i'm right here so <laughs> I, th <laughs> I, th I think that that going forward this is something that the community and, and beam and and everyone involved in the project that we can all all share and, and grow with each other. Yeah, definitely. And I would like to invite each one of you guys to, I mean, what, what we're talking about is not the kind of, you know, a, a philosophy for everybody. I mean, we're not trying to say that we, we've reached the truth and we are the only ones that do understand what needs to be done. I mean, we're, philosophy is mainly something that is related to a very, I would say, individual and personal path. So if I need you know, to, if I would like you to see any kind of success after this AMA, try to build your own philosophy. Try to build your own, I would say, privacy path. Read whatever you want to read. You can read Frederick Nietzsche. You can read Arthur Schopenhauer. You can read the amazing Ralph uh, Valdo Emerson or David uh, Henry Thoreau or Confucius or Lao Tzu or whoever you want. But build your own privacy. And your privacy maybe is not going to fit uh, your neighbor, you know, privacy needs. But at least you will go on a private way, and I will feel that my mission is completed. Yeah, exactly. I mean, at the end of the day, we're creating a tool rather than uh, installing uh, ideas. I mean, exactly. privacy is for the individual, and, and this is largely different among uh, different societies and different cultures, like uh, you mentioned in, in the beginning. And I think this is, um, this is also important to understand uh, when you're communicating with with other people about privacy, I mean, it's it's not the idea; it's the tools that can allow you to to have privacy, essentially. Yeah, and if you need to conclude with a little, you know, philosophy, very philosophy lessons, you have two kinds of philosophy. You have the teacher of philosophies that are teaching you what you need to do, and you have the philosophers that are living a philosophical life. It's not the same thing. You have Plato on one side that is dealing with ideas, and you you have Mark, Marcus Aurelius that is dealing with practica. And at Beam, we are dealing with practica. Ideas, it's very nice, but we need to have a practical understanding of financial privacy and crypto. And this is Beam. Yeah, absolutely agree. Someone has just asked about KYC and AML regulations on Beam, and I mean, I think this is different between regions like we were just mentioning this is i mean this country is different to that country and and for people i mean it the auditability that will come to being it's going to be opt-in and i think this is yeah. one of the important things not just for auditability but for privacy i mean going back to the beginning privacy is about uh, allowing others certain information that you disclose to them and I mean, Definitely. this is this for me is the most important thing for for privacy and for Beam and for for crypto <laughs> or for any privacy coins and cryptocurrency as well. One percent. Who's your guest? Cool. We're gonna sign off there. 
I think uh, actually I'd, I'd really again like to thank all of the community that submitted questions beforehand and also everyone that joined us in the in the YouTube chat tonight. This has been fun and, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you guys, really. Thank you. Thank you for your support and for being here, really. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.